Hi, my name is Jeff Montes de Oca. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. I'm the director of the Center for Critical Sports Studies, and I am the president of the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport in this very eventful year of 2020. In this video, I want to talk to you about one of the most basic terms that we have in any sport class, particularly sports sociology class, and that is sport. What do we mean when we say sport? It's one of those words um, that seems really straightforward and clear and kind of like you don't even need to think about it. We just know what it is because we've always uh, known what it is. But if you spend some time actually thinking about it, one of the things you, re you realize is that it's a pretty complicated term. It's nothing straightforward about it at all. For instance, when I'm teaching classes and I ask students to say, to define what is sport, one of the words that they use almost consists, uh, I should say oh, every time, basically, almost pretty much every student will say one word when defining sport. And that word, I'm sure you can guess, is competition. So it would seem that competition is definitional to sport. The funny thing is, is that hasn't always been the case. And even today, we can find examples of sport not centered on competition. Traditional sports, for instance, tended to be religious events or uh, aspects of holy days, what in a secular society we call holidays. The ancient Olympics, these were human activities intended to honor the gods who were sitting atop of Mount Olympus. So while I'm sure that some people, uh, you know, participating in the Olympics and said the gods favor me, that really wasn't the point of uh, the ancient uh, Olympics. So rather than thinking of sport lists as these kind of timeless, immutable things, just like fixed, in sociology, we, we consider them to be symbolic categories which means there's a whole bunch of different human activities and we just sort of lump them all together into this thing and uh, this category and then we call it sport. Some of those activities, such as basketball, soccer, hockey, volleyball, tennis, uh, they don't need a whole lot of discussion. We kind of know they're a sport. People have always called them sports. They've always been sports, so we don't really reflect on them a whole lot. But let's think about it like this. Some of the human activities that were first called sport includes hunting, dogfighting, and bull baiting. And if you don't know what bull baiting is, it's when you sick a bunch of dogs on a bull and they err, tear it up and kill it. Yeah, so that was a, one of the, the early sports, one of the early activities that were considered sports. Then there's a whole bunch of other sort of newer things um, that you in your class, you might want to talk about and debate. Like, is this thing a sport or is this not a sport, such as cheerleading or esports? So they're not sort of like clearly a sport, but then they're not clearly not a sport. Um, or at least debates can be, arguments can be made. When we debate whether or not cheerleading and esports are sports, uh, what we, in sociology, we call that boundary work. Because what we're doing is through our discussion and through our debate, we're clarifying what sits in the category of sport and what sits outside of the category of sport. And one of the things I think that this shows is nothing is inherently a sport. What we consider a sport results from a social process and therefore it changes over time. For instance, bull baiting and dog fighting were clearly sports at one time, but now they're generally considered animal abuse. So then we might think about, and this is something you could talk about in class, what, what sports today may be viewed as abuse in the future? You might also want to discuss why people start calling something a sport if it wasn't called a sport before. Because obviously everything had to start being, come, being called a sport. At some point it wasn't a sport, and now it is. So esports for me are a great example of this, and they, they reflect the changing landscape of sport, the sporting landscape. Over the 20th century, a clear business model developed uh, to market and sell sports to large audiences as spectacles. 
people got really good at it and they made a lot of money out of it. Well, gaming companies like Riot and Blizzard and Nintendo, well, they, uh, they decided they wanted to tap into those resources so that they could sell video game competitions to large global audiences. Well, calling it and marketing video games as esports became really, really effective for doing that. As a sociologist who studies sports, I have found the late Henning Eichberg's what he calls a sport trialectic really useful for understanding sport, or what we mean by the term sport. Eichberg suggests that we think of three kinds of sports. The first he calls achievement sports. And these are what we typically think of uh, when we think of sports because they're based on competition. So these disciplines are structured by competition and therefore strive for measurable achievements, whether it's scoring the most points, uh, getting the fastest time, lifting the most weight, or taking the fewest swings, or whatever the measure is. It needs to be an objective, clear measure. And of course, we could talk about some of the judge sports, which are not as clear and objective, and they kind of drive everybody crazy. Um, but the ultimate goal of achievement sports is measurable outcomes or production. The second category he calls fitness sports, which, you know, you might have already thought of. These disciplines are structured by the goals of health, hygiene, um, and aesthetics, or aesthetics, I should say. So although we might get competitive when doing these, what makes an activity a fitness sport and not an achievement sport is the goal of health, hygiene, and or aesthetics, rather than winning as the desired outcome. So I always differentiate when talking about this between jogging for health or weight loss from running uh, a race to win it, right? To run running to win races. One of the things that achievement sports and fitness sports have in common is they both tend to be instrumentally rational. And what I mean is, although they might have different ends, winning versus health, both want to maximize uh, the efficiency of achieving a goal outside of the activity itself. So I could run to win a medal, or I could run to drop five pounds. I could lift weights to win a game, or I could lift weights to gain five pounds. The means to end rationality of both of these types of sport make them very modern and consistent with the logic of capitalism. And this gets us to Eichberg's third category, what he called bodily experience. Here the focus is on movement as a sensual experience, and generally with the, uh, tied to the formation of community, what in sociology we would call social solidarity. He gives the example of folk traditions or traditional games, since these activities are not really about you know, maximizing winning or maximizing health, but instead creating identities and communities. I always think of drum circles and dancing in the park as an example of bodily experience, where it's really about the pleasure of the movement, the sound and the movement and the community, rather than trying to win something or necessarily get healthy. But in class, you might want to discuss what, what might be other examples of bodily movement. One of the things that I would hope is obvious is that none of these categories are mutually exclusive. A good example for me is high school football. Clearly, football in the United States is definitional of achievement sports. Think of the saying that Vince Lombardi used to, uh, used to like to say, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. At the same time, one of the main reasons that kids participate in high school football is because of family and friends. So participation for most people is as much about identity and community as it is about uh, competition and winning. We could also look at the very famous race, Beta Breakers race in San Francisco. When you look at this race, at the front of the pack are some very, very serious win runners trying to win a uh, prestigious race. In the middle of the pack are a lot of casual runners they have no hope of winning the race, but they keep fit, and they're trying to get the best times that they can. At the back of the pack 
are thousands of people who dress up in costumes. They're completely oblivious to the time it takes to run the race because that's not the point at all. What they do is they're enjoying the community that forms around this race every single year. And so the same sporting event can house an expression of achievement sport, an expression of fitness sport, and an expression of bodily experience. Well, I hope this has been interesting and will help uh, with your discussions in class. Thanks a lot. Bye.